Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome to the Mataka webinar, Living, Learning, and Working After COVID-19. We thank the MIT Alumni Association and Moana Benton for her assistance in making this webinar possible. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived for viewing in the Mataka Infinite Connection website. There will be an audience Q&A session following the conversation with our featured guests. Over the course of the webinar, we invite you to submit your questions using the Zoom Q&A feature. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. I'm Pamela Tang, president of Mataka. Joining me from the Mataka board are board members and your moderators, Kenneth Nam Kung and Marilee Snepomachi. This is a forum for us to share the timely conversations around today's built environment through the lens of course for alumni. It has been five months since the first shelter in place order took effect. As the coronavirus continues its grip on the world, many aspects of American life will continue to be upended. We have all embraced these immediate changes with tenacity, but what are the medium and long-term impacts on living, learning, and working? How do we prepare for the future? Here to help us understand the dynamics and trends of this unprecedented disruption are fellow Course 4 alumni, Liz Burrow and Elliot Felix, distinguished industry strategic thought leaders at the forefront of workplace and higher education solutions. They bring their unique brands of design thinking, research, and operational insights to advance innovation in reinventing the future of work and learning. We look forward to a spirited and enriching conversation. Let's start, shall we? Ken and Marilise. Okay, great. Um, if you don't mind, I'll um, uh, jump right in. But um, in order to sort of uh, kind of help orient um, the discussion, um, um, Elliot and Liz, would you mind uh, maybe kind of uh, giving us your quick origin stories, telling us a little bit about your area of practice, and maybe discuss a little bit how um, MIT helped sort of um, uh, get you to uh, where you are now? Sure. Hi, Ken. Thanks for having us. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, uh, well, our origin story is we met at MIT, um, and we met at the Plotter, but Liz doesn't remember. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I think, you know, for that alone, MIT changed our lives. Um, I thought I was going to MIT to get an, an amazing education in technology and digital fabrication. And it turns out I was terrible at all of that. Um, but I think what it really taught me among many, many skills that I still use today is the spirit of curiosity and collaboration um, across all sorts of expertise and the the openness to give your time um, and to help others. And I, I always talk about that uh, that I got from MIT. I use it every single day of my life in, in my practice. Um, what I do now is uh, internal innovation, design research, uh, consumer insights and workplace strategy. Um, I recently left WeWork as VP of Workplace Strategy and Enterprise Solutions, where I was uh, intaking client, the voice of the client and uh, informing the next iteration of the enterprise product. So I'm very up to speed on uh, flexible workplace, uh, what enterprise clients are trying to do um, now and long term in, in COVID. Uh, and, the, uh, the crises we're in. Um, and I'm really excited to um, be on the next, uh, you know, sort of thinking how I can bring my expertise to the table for my next uh, career challenge. And go ahead, Emily. <laughs> I also, I also uh, am very thankful for my MIT experience and to you as well, Ken, because I think 
we met, uh, we went to undergrad together and we met on my campus visit. And I think those conversations helped me understand what a great place it was. And uh, I certainly learned a lot. I feel like I, uh, I went into MIT more of a thinker and I came out more of a maker. And I learned how to experiment, how to think with my hands, how to live the Mems et Manus motto and uh, how to really uh, focus physical places on people. I think I, I too thought I was going there for technical know-how um, and I, I learned a lot more about myself than about people. And that really set me on the path that, that I'm on now, which was uh, about nine years ago, founding a company called Brightspot. And we're on a mission to make the student experience of higher education more engaging and more equitable. And we, we think the best way to do that is to help a college or a university transform their, uh, their programs, their places, and their people at the same time. And that really only, that's really only possible if you, understand, um, if you understand students and faculty and staff and community and alumni, and, uh, and then you give them a say in shaping their own future, and then you experiment and you test things out as you work toward that future. Mm -hmm. we're, we're also lucky enough to have MIT, call MIT uh, a client and uh, worked on a, a variety of different projects. All great. of which would be great. Great. Well, I think it's so kind of <clears throat> um, sort of uh, amazing that sort of, well, what's, what's a good way to put this? I mean, you, you know, you, you very clearly kind of linked your MIT education to, to, to your careers and you also talked about, I remember, you just spoke about this notion of kind of helping students and faculty sort of, you know, um, understand like uh, kind of gain a sense of themselves and sort of understand how kind of they can have their own agency. And to me, that really links to sort of um, the MIT education. It teaches you not so much an agenda or a pedagogy, but it teaches you more than anything else how to um, really think for yourself. It teaches you how to teach yourself. And I think that's kind of one of the things that in my own career, for whatever that's worth, you sort of, uh, I, I, keep, I, I keep going back to. Um, so thank you for that. Okay, so I'm going to start um, start with kind of the first question, which is obviously, um, you know, we've all been through um, as a culture and as a society, society and as individuals, as families, um, as parents and what have you, we've all been through um, a lot. So before we even talk about um, kind of the future, how we get to sort of the question of where we're headed, how we, li how we live, how we work, how we learn, um, how are the two of you uh, making sense of, of uh, where we are now, you know, the current situation? Well, I think we can, yeah, we can tackle the uh, where we are and how we live. Um, mm -hmm. In that, Elliot and I made a, a really reflective and decisive um, action, and we moved from Brooklyn to Minneapolis six weeks ago. I think it shocked a lot of people, um, but actually, it, it in our minds, it was COVID really accelerated something we had been talking about for a long time, mm -hmm. and we just said we have the means, let's take this opportunity. Um, and so we're living in a, in a whole new world uh, and, and reinventing ourselves and our community and our lives here. Um, but we're really happy with the decision and we, with the same mindset, we think, you know, we're gonna grow and we're gonna learn from this. Um, and uh, so far it's really been great and we're really grateful to, um, to be healthy in, in all the sort of like mechanics of what we've been doing. Um, mm. I think we as professionals now, like we now sit across the table from each other every day and we hear each other's conversations. And, you know, a lot of them are around the three crises we're in. So there's a huge financial crisis. There's a huge uh, social justice crisis and racial, sorry, racial justice crisis and um, a public health crisis. And I think um, in many of our conversations, we're trying to make sure that we don't separate those out, that how we talk and how we respond, um, weave those, those, uh, those needs and reflections together um, because they are intertwined. Um, we're trying to think about how we can be productive and action oriented in what we do for our clients and our community. Um, but also really reflective on what, uh, what is going on with our profession. 
um, and and the education. What do we, you know, how can we instill uh, new mindsets or new um, methods and ways of um, uh, teaching, hiring, enrolling students that um, are as diverse and uh, you know as the community we designed for. Oh, that's a great that's a great summary. I think the, you know the only thing I'll add is that the bit about how COVID accelerated something we had been thinking about. Um, in a way, that's how professionally we've been thinking about these three crises as really um, accelerators in some ways of what higher ed has already been dealing with and maybe decelerators in other in other ways. And that's helped us kind of process the current moment. You know, we uh, it, it really picked up the pace and people learning online and people working remotely. Um, it unfortunately picked up or, or, or uh, highlighted a lot of gaps in terms of uh, equity, in terms of student experience by, you know, by race and income and background. Um, so it's really, it's really intensified a lot of the, um, a lot of the things that were already happening and brought them into sharper focus and allowed us to, I think, you know, work with, work together to try and solve these problems or make progress at the very least. Yeah, I think we're, you know, I think a lot of people feel like we've ended the first chapter of, of this pandemic. Um, and now we're opening up, the, you know, which was sort of, how do we solve for now? How do we feel safe? Um, and how do we survive? And now I think professionals and clients are asking, well, what does the next 12 to 24 months look like? So what's the midterm? Um, how do we prepare for that? And then, you know, everyone wants to know um, and talk to the crystal ball and know what of what's happening today will be sustaining change long-term. Um, and I think we have, you know, evidence and predictions, but I think only time will tell what, um, and what we, we, I think we should think that we have some agency and what we can raise as something to really sink our teeth into and say like, we should make sure that this is a sustaining change, that this isn't just a, a blip in time. So I think that's sort of how we kind of like see the, the world through those three lenses. Great. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's actually a, a very good way to kind of orient um, kind of the overall arc of this, um, uh, of this discussion. So with that, actually, I'm going to um, hand off the torch to uh, Marilise to um, ask um, uh, the, the next round of questions. Okay. Well, so thanks for the great introduction. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Elliot. I think it's going to be an amazing conversation. Certainly um, the most timely thing we can imagine. Since my time at the Institute, I've had uh, my feet planted in really the two worlds that you're talking about, one put in practice and the other in higher education, and most recently in higher education administration. So um, I work at a very large public research one urban university um, in Miami, Florida, which is the new epicenter for the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these issues around academic continuity and remote and online and hybrid learning, reopening campuses, assessing the economic, social justice and public health impacts of where we are, are precisely the center of my working universe. Um, I am looking forward to this conversation very much. So to follow the arc that you set up, let's start with the near term with what happened immediately after the crisis was sort of recognized and understood. How are you seeing spaces being reconfigured in response to COVID? From the work perspective, um, I think there was a real emphasis on just like the physical and the tangible. And um, even though people weren't returning to work, people knew the timeline to plan to return to work needed to start immediately. So. There was an emphasis, at least from WeWork and flexible space providers, um, for the member experience to create a kit of parts. So a real clear understanding of how to de-densify, how to instill new um, uh, cleanliness practice and um, physical and cyber security practices, 
and operational plans that were um, uh, both communicated uh, outwardly you know, in the space as, as well to the teams and the vendors internally. So um, I think that that was, you know, that happened and, I, and all, we see that all around um, people uh, putting up their playbooks to share um, and share out. Uh, I think from the member perspective, they were really just interested in when I come back, how is it safe? Um, do you have a readiness plan or a readiness kit for me? And how do I feel and understand that it's clean? You know, so from the user experience, there was a lot of, it was really interesting for me because there's a lot of emphasis on like cleaning theatrics um, and, and really clear FAQs and communication plans out to the member who was very nervous um, about returning to work. The thing that I think is less, tan like, less easy to see, but now we know is far more um, uh, a complex conversation is uh, indoor air quality and um, mechanical and HVAC systems. So I'm not an expert in that, but um, the people that are, are doing an amazing job, really trying to tackle something that I think is a, um, you know, a, a gnarly problem. And I think that uh, I suspect um, they are going to be at the forefront of many conversations as people do return to work. Okay. I, I think all those things apply in higher ed. I think, you know, there's, there's a concern about, then about de-densifying classrooms. There's a, you know, operational considerations about health and safety and cleanliness. Um, and one of the, uh, one of the great things about working side by side the last four or five months is, you know, we've been able to share notes on these kinds of things. And um, uh, in a way, uh, you were you were a bit ahead of the curve. So we were able to actually learn, you know, the, learn from the workplace and um, how it might get returned to service. Yeah, I would say one of the, for me, that all feels very um, tactical. The one area that seems really exciting and interesting in the short term is the marriage of um, technology. Us. Yes. The, yes. I'm just kidding. Yes. Sorry. The, um, um, the really kind of uh, technology companies and platforms uh, really stepping up and saying, if you're really going to calm the nerves of your users, you need to communicate and forecast and broadcast um, in advance of coming to a space what the space is going to be like. So there's a lot of, um, okay, there's a lot of interesting uh, platforms um, that are borrowing from retail and uh, hospitality experiences so that we can really think from a user, what is it like to leave your house and come into your destination in a seamless way, and you're not getting um, these hiccups, uh, you know, how do I know when to get on the elevator, how do I know if my desk is reserved, all these kinds of things. So I think in the short term, it's really exciting to see like mega advances in products out in the market um, that marry space and what it can offer with um, advance notice. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, as just as an aside, I think communication is one thing that higher education has done really well in uh, during this crisis. We did a national student survey, and one of the things we asked students was, how well are your institutions doing um, on all these different fronts? And the highest, uh, the highest ranking was communication. So, I mean, maybe now they have the most captive audience, uh, whereas months ago, students weren't opening too many emails, but, um, uh, you know, I think that is getting better. And I, I do think this has prompted technology to be an interface between people and space in a way that it always has been, but even more so now and maybe even more urgently, like campuses are doing really interesting things with geofencing, right? Where you get a, um, you walk on campus and you get a push notification to submit your health status. Um, or you get a push notification that says, you know, the library opens in, in an hour or, um, you know, so I think we're going to see really interesting things around uh, location aware um, technology. We're going to see really interesting things around um, this interface, whether it's, you know, booking a seat 
um, or ordering a meal uh, because you know these these things allow people to manage resources better. Uh, they allow you the kind of assurance that you're going to get a seat if you trek across campus to the you know to the library, which now can only hold a third a third as many people. Um, so uh, I think that's all you know that's all pretty interesting. Obviously, it has to be done in a way that um, safeguards data privacy, but it, it creates some some interesting opportunities. I would imagine, yeah. I was going to ask you about practices that have developed over the course of the sort of initial response to the pandemic. Um, your talk about infrastructure and, and your early talk talked a little bit about the sort of theater of cleaning. There is a lot of choreography around um, responses to the pandemic. I wonder if you could talk about what you're seeing out there. I think um, one of the things that we find really fascinating is internally um, we've we made a huge effort to get clients and disciplines to share what's going on or even regions around the world like you know Ken and, and we were talking before about um, his work in Asia and uh, in 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 my work talking to people in Asia was like opening a door to the future because you could actually see six months or sorry, six weeks in advance, what's gonna happen and can you borrow from them? Can you take their kits and run with it? But one of the things we found uh, really interesting is all of these C-suites were saying, we're doing this really interesting new thing. It's called daily standups. And we meet every day and we have a powwow and then we break out and we know what we're doing because we have to act so quickly. You know, every day is like a sprint. And we said, that's great. That's actually a thing. It's called agile design and it's, if there's a manifesto about it, and you should do that every every day, you know, um, not just in a crisis, because it's so effective to have these bite-sized check-ins versus you know a monthly or quarterly check-in. And um, so I think the integrate like the idea of integrated planning um, and these uh, these fast-paced conversations, it's really exciting to see. And in my own practice, I'm talking to people I've never talked to before, and having mm -hmm totally new relationships with the head of health and safety, um, physical security, um, brand and communication design. You know, it's, it's really um, been great to, to form those relationships and realize it should always be like this. We should always be talking and moving really quickly together. Yep, that sounds good. As we wrap up to sort of look at the near term, um, are there common themes that you're finding in your work mm -hmm. across education and work practice? Well, it's it's a good question. And I, I think the way we've been able to process some of these, uh, some of everything that's happening and um, understand those themes is through lots and lots of conversations. So we've done you know, national student surveys. We've also checked in with lots of clients and uh, had, you know, talked to 60 plus universities and we've done all these. Uh, in doing so, we realized that they really wanted to talk to each other. So we've, we've facilitated all these peer-to-peer -peer forums and um, which incidentally, you know, that our consulting model is, is based heavily on MIT emeritus professor Ed Schein who, he literally wrote the book on organizational consulting. It's called, <laughs> it's called Process Consulting. And, you know, that's taught us, in, you know, in a moment of uncertainty, um, talk to your clients and, and do it with them. So from all these conversations, um, I've had so many walk, I've had so many walking meetings and so many conversations. It's, it's really, I've learned a lot, but um, there's some clear things in a bubble to the top from all those conversations. One is, is uh, community and belonging. I think that really jumped off the page from our survey. That's what students were missing. Um, they, you know, they adjusted to online coursework pretty well, but you know, a sense of belonging, being part of a community, connecting with mentors, student activities, you know, all the, the, the sense of community that a campus helps foster was the biggest you know, hole in their, uh, in their experience. And, um, and so that really jumped off the page. I think, you know, equity issues that we talked about, I think serendipity, uh, you know, I think, you know, the interesting thing about 
the online world is that it's much more intentional. You know, things have to be planned. Um, oftentimes that's a good thing. You know, you, you have to really, like if you're teaching online, you really have to, you really have to think through how it's gonna work. You know, like you might have had to record that video a month ago, um, whereas you might be able to ad lib in the room. So you have this, the intentionality of online, but uh, you miss the serendipity of the, you know, of the face-to-face. -face. And, um, you know, that's a lot of what place is for, is to, is to create those chance encounters. Um, and I think the same in, in workplace. So, you know, a lot of what we're selling is the idea of places to congregate, places to have um, uh, spontaneous conversations. And so in the absence of that, does it go away or can you reinvent it anew? Uh, maybe, uh, you know, event design um, and experience design take the place of spatial design. So I think that's a short-term solution, but um, we can talk more in the long-term solution of uh, what is space for? Because I think, um, I mean, we, we definitely shared across the, the table that um, people really miss the sense of community, um, the vibrancy of face-to-face uh, -face interactions, and you can work really well productively um, at home or in a in a private space, um, but you can't build it. It's harder to build a community um, and have a life experience um, in isolation. Yeah. Fair enough. Ken. Yes. You want to go <clears throat> into the next phase of this? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> We're and doing new chapters, so chapter two. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I'll be very, very honest in that. Um, I think this is sort of a really great conversation to be having. You know, um, you know, I, I live in New York City. Um, Liz and Elliot um, just just um, uh, left, but we've been through a, a very, very difficult, you know, uh, four or five months, and the city is just now starting to reopen. You know, stores are coming back, restaurants and bars are slowly coming back, offices. Some of them are reopening. Actually, many of them um, are not. But, you know, I, I think it's quite clear to uh, anyone who lives in, uh, in the five boroughs that, you know, normal isn't going to happen anytime soon. So I think um, one of the first questions is um, basically heading into the fall and looking really at the next one year, two years, 12 to 24 months out. Um, what are your own kind of clients, collaborators um, are looking to, to do next? What is the role of the physical kind of place, this zone of sort of you know, face-to-face -face interactions, like how, what role does that play moving forward? And, you know, as you know, my, my own company um, is kind of, we're, we're trying to figure this out some as well. And we've staked out a very, very um, specific um, position. So, but, but, I, but I think we're all really looking forward to hearing um, your, your own take, uh, takes on this. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think, the interesting thing is that uh, there's so much in common, but there's also so many differences regionally based on what the public health guidelines are, um, what the conditions on the ground are. And one of the things that I've been, I've been trying to do for the last couple of years at Brightspot is help more than one client at a time. Um, you know, getting to the point in my career, I've worked with about 80 universities, and uh, I'm anxious to make, have a greater impact and help more people at a time. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we've been look, figuring out how we could do these multi-client studies, and you know, responding to COVID, I think was one of those uh, was one of those chances to do that because you've got a lot of people with a kind of a common foe or a common problem. So. Uh, we, we worked with uh, three different universities on aspects of their you know, reopening plans, how to do it safely, how to do it carefully, how to prepare, what the reduced capacities were. And the interesting part about that is they were in three different parts of the country. And, um, and in our first meeting, I had my kind of like typical facilitator uh, um, muscles flexing. And I was trying to sort of drive them toward consensus around this, you know, around the solution. And then one of them actually reminded me in the middle of the session, he's like, well, we don't actually all have to do the same thing. <laughs> and I said, oh, you're, you know, you're right. Um, so, 
I, you know, to me, that's a little, it's, it's, a, it's a window into what's happening, which is, you know, what makes sense in Massachusetts may not make sense in, you know, Montana. Um, and, uh, you know, it all depends on uh, so many different, you know, so many different factors. Uh, but there may, you know, there are, there's a common set of things to think about, but how you solve those things uh, may, may differ quite, quite a bit. Yeah, and just to build on that, I think in in the work experience, again, I my hope is that the employee can have a very strong voice in the matter. I think that's that's happened in the short term. There's been a lot of pulse surveys through HR to figure out um, who wants to come back, how often, where are they located. Um, but it can't just be a one-time pulse. We have to continue to ask the question. Um, try out new ways of working, so you see if it's working or not, and adjust. And I think that's, of course, what we work is um, banking on is flexibility and, and thinking a lot about the idea of a hub and spoke model. So um, three tiers of work experience. So working from home when the, the work style and the work dictates it, working locally in your community in a, in a hub, so more of like the satellite office, um, yesterday year, and then working centrally in an HQ um, location and coming there for a very intentional purpose, like to collaborate, to make a decision, um, to have a, a very specific business development uh, meeting. Um, and so, you know, similarly, the idea was let's solution and bring those ideas to the market and see. Um, uh, you know, it's really kind of this question of, I have people, how much space do I need in COVID? Or I have space, how many people can I fit in? Mm -hmm. um, and then where are they and how often do they want to come in? So just, you know, there's a lot of modeling and testing out with sales, like who is interested in what, what, what can people afford, um, what is attractive? But I, but I really appreciate the idea of it's not home or office, but there's a, there's a third thing, which is this more locally driven experience. And you could say the same for the learning experience, because some people um, may, maybe can't come back to campus, but maybe work uh, studying at home isn't an option either. <clears throat> so in a sense, then you're kind of talking about sort of, you know, we're talking about this older, moving from this older model of like home work and there's a very clear boundary between the two to sort of almost this sort of this kind of kind of uh, gradation this hybridization between um uh the two poles and you know, people can sort of occupy at different times and uh, at different lengths sort of different positions sort of you know between those two so you're basically talking about this kind of hybrid world it's not you're not it's not home or work but it's this sort of blending of the two and i think for a lot of people depending on pers personalities and sort of their own personal situations you know i think there's going to be potentially a, a lot of adaptation involved. Like, you know, what, when I was working from home, I'll, I'll be very honest, like after a few weeks, I'm just going stir crazy, right? So, which, which talks about one kind of very specific kind of response and approach. So how do you find ways to sort of make sure that people are able to sort of be happy, to be healthy, to be engaged and productive within sort of like this entire spectrum of possibilities that, um, that, that exists? Hmm. Well, I guess, one thing that comes to mind is part of these new um, part of these new situations we put ourselves in require us to make things explicit and um, and maybe revisit norms. I mean, I think I, I feel like just as a two quick examples. Um, one is I think maybe once I saw somebody eat on a video conference before COVID, but now that happens all the time because it's like, you know, uh, people used to eat at their desk where people would have working meetings and now you're not sitting across the table, you like you're sitting across the screens. So what seemed really weird, like why is this person eating in a video conference? It's like gonna kind of become a thing that's okay, maybe, I don't know. So, you know, there are gonna be all these new situations we're put in and um, we're going to have to like check in with each other and say, Hey, is this okay? And anybody mind if I, you know, um, you know, I'm starving, I got to eat what, you know, whatever. 
And, uh, and so I think we're all just going to have to be a little bit more empathetic. I think we're all going to have to be a little bit more proactive in how we communicate. And then we're going to, you know, have to look at those um, points of friction. And I think um, as much as technology can be seamless, it's also going to create, you know, new awkward situations until we, you know, until we get used to it. Like I, I remember for, you know, our son, when our son turned one, we couldn't get, uh, you know, we, we couldn't get everybody in town. So we had, uh, you know, we had like a high chair and a bunch of cupcakes. And then we had two iPads, one with each grandma, uh, you know, on the table. And that's not so far from like what's going to happen this fall at every college, uh, mm -hmm. right? There's going to be people in the room and then there's going to be people in their own room. And somehow we have to create an experience for all of them. Um, and I think that, you know, the real thing is we have to do it, making sure uh, that we're doing it in an equitable and inc inclusive way, because I think it's, you know, that's where the real danger is, you know, that you create, you have a bunch of people that are sitting in coach and they're, you know, at home and they're looking into business class in the room, or, you know, you get, uh, you get someone who uh, chooses to, you know, to not come back into the office because they need the flexibility to, you know, care for a, care for a kid or a, or a parent or whoever it is, you know, and that person is, uh, you know, is dialing in and they miss, you know, the five minutes before the meeting and the five minutes after the meeting, which are actually the two most, you know, that's, that, that 10 minutes really is the meeting and the rest is theater. So, um, you know, I'm excited about the, about a new hybrid reality. I'm excited about this mix of like intentionality and serendipity. Um, we're gonna have so much great data, you know, mm -hmm. because you can measure the digital world a lot easier than you can the physical world. Um, but it's gonna be awkward and we're just gonna have to talk about it and, uh, and, and, and set new, new norms. Yeah. But I, and I've been thinking a lot about this and talking a little bit about it, that I think in addition to externally expressing um, new norms, new behaviors, new expectations, you can actually assign someone the role of director of hybrid work or director of remote work. And their job is, is they become the, the cafe, right? You know, their job is to create serendipity, yeah. um, uh, which, you know, it's nice in and of itself, but the point is to make sure that um, weak ties are made, um, innov innovation, new ideas are still clicking uh, internally um, and you're bettering business. You're mm -hmm. forming better teams um, because they know each other more. So I think what was what we leaned on space to do previously, it might need to be more intentional. Like as Elliot was saying, someone who intentionally is doing the job of serendipity. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think also checking, you know, HR is a big job of checking in with people and training managers to make sure that people are engaged, um, that uh, they're comfortable um, in whatever situation um, they've chosen, uh, because you can't look across the room and, and check in with someone's vibe, right, when you're only zooming in. Um, and seeing each other in that way. Great. No, I, I think that's some, um, these, these are some absolutely um, re really th uh, fantastic insights and really kind of gets to the nation, uh, to the uh, nature of what is sort of um, uh, working and learning and how sort of really everything is going to change um, given, <clears throat> given current events. Um, I do know that for um, this section, kind of like the medium term impacts and response to COVID-19 and everything else that's going on. We did have one more question slated, but because we're a few minutes behind schedule, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually going to sort of um, uh, end this now. And I'm going, I'd like to hand this off to Marilise to talk about sort of uh, really um, how we as a culture and as societies kind of start to think about um, how things change um, in the long term um, moving forward. So. Well, so I'm happy to segue into a longer term, but I'm hoping that we can maybe capture a little bit about the medium term when it comes to issues of um, diversity and equity and inclusion. A lot of what you were just talking about with respect to hybridity and missing the real meeting, the one that happens five minutes before 
and five minutes after. If you don't have access, that's one of the opportunities that will be missed, and, and that among many. I wonder if you all could speak a little bit to that issue um, as we then sort of ramp it up into a, a sort of longer term view um, on what's going on. Um, I think from, you know, the, the little I've studied on remote work manifestos, one of the, um, one of the points is the work culture decides to write everything down, um, and there, and make it transparent. Um, and I think that's sort of going one step farther than maybe some companies have had to, I, there's this, um, great dad joke, uh, who was in charge of your digital transformation? Was it your CEO, your CTO, or COVID-19, right? So it, overnight, a lot of companies suddenly had to give laptops um, and allow those people to take those laptops home. They had to start working on uh, shared cloud platforms. Um, but in the, in the next step further is to make information very accessible and searchable um, and to to really um, remove the idea of um, closed door conversations um, and make things more transparent. And I think that just has nothing really to do with COVID. That hopefully should be happening universal. And I would hope that that's one of the things that we can slingshot into the future is um, being really um, intentional with how we, the conversations we have and um, and making sure that it's that those conversations are accessible to everyone. Um, I think from a from a professional perspective, um, you know, this is switching gears a little bit, but there's been a lot of discussion around um, uh, you know racist architecture and racist city planning and. Um, both the profession itself isn't very reflective of the communities it designs for and the pedagogy and the methodologies we use to design um, don't use a lot of empathic or listening skills, um, uh, let alone um, have, you know, like are a mirror of the, of the communities they serve. So I think um, we're both really passionate about trying to um, take action on that in our own way in, um, you know, as, as practitioners, as people who hire other people, um, as people who can teach in universities. Um, and the thing that I think we can bring to the table is a lot of um, human-centered design and design thinking methodologies, which they themselves have been critiqued, but at least get a sense, a new mindset of um, empathy, um, and understanding and coming from a place of it's our job um, to listen, it's not our job to talk, I think um, would be a really great starting point. Um, and, to, and, and to see if we can start to, I mean, we as a community, everyone on this call, and I think a lot of discussions in architecture in general um, are really trying to make sense of um, equity and diversity in architecture, and we've been talking about that for a long time, but I hope a sustaining change is that um, the, you know, we as practitioners and educators can, can demand to see more change and, and bring ideas to the table um, so that when we come out of this in the, you know, five years from now, uh, who is a registered architect is totally different than who is on this on the, the roster today. Yeah, and I'll I'll just add one quick thing, which is I think that you know the transparency and the participation is really important. And I think the other thing we're encouraging folks to do is segmentation. With you know, look at specific communities and look at their needs. You know, and generally averages are terrible, right? Like. On, Michael Jordan and I on, have an average of three NBA championships, right? So I must be, I must be amazing, right? So um, averages generally suck. And if you can rather, if you can segment your populations and understand what different communities need, there is no one, one student experience. Um, it, it varies based on your background, based on your lived experience, based on your, your race, based on your income, based on your resources. 
um, that's really a way uh, to you know to shine a light on on some of the issues. And if you keep you know if you keep lumping everyone together, um, that's great for like singing kumbaya, but it's not really that great for understanding like what a specific community needs and how you can help them. You're muted. Sorry, I was gonna say, it's a very great way to give perspective on the enterprise. As you look to the longer term, and I don't know how long that long term is, and I'd be interested in knowing your perspective on that. Um, how do you imagine that organizations, institutions, um, of higher learning, of work, of actually all of the institutions in our society are likely to change? Um, what do you think, what do you hope will stick from the new practices that you've seen developing and where do you still think that we need to develop more? Well, I think my, my quick take on higher ed is that there's good news and bad. I think the bad news is that we already had an oversupply problem in a way. There were more seats than there are students. The demographics have been in decline and, uh, and a lot of, uh, institutions were not on very stable footing um, and now we've got a bit of a shockwave and so uh, you know a lot of people are talking about 10 to 20 percent of the institutions closing you know that's there's 4400 institutions institutions nationally that's a lot of people that's a lot of jobs that's a lot of disruption um, so I think step one is going to be that kind of reckoning um, and then step two is going to be the, you know, the folks that survive and thrive are going to be the ones that can really adapt, that are much more focused. They're not trying to be all things to all people. They're focusing on the, the, you know, the, the programs where they have strength. They're focusing on what their community needs. Um, and uh, and they, they're building these muscles to, uh, to adapt to, uh, you know, they're valuing an, an agility as much as they're valuing tradition. Um, so, uh, but I, you know, that said, I'm incredibly hopeful, um, because I think, uh, I think COVID can teach universities not only to broaden access, but to increase excellence. And, uh, and that's a, you know, that's an exciting future. I'm, I'm hopeful from the work perspective, um, again, sustaining change um, and, and glimmers of, of real uh, you know, emphasis on things that people have probably been pounding their fists about for a long time. I know my friends that talk about indoor air quality, they've been talking about that for a long time and suddenly they have an enormous microphone at the table. Um, I think also from people who are literally interested in designing the physical and the tactical and, and the and the, the, um, the spaces themselves, I think we'll see a lot more kind of cleanliness affordances in design. I think about like the white lab coat or the porcelain toilet. You know, we want space to, to tell us it's clean. Um, and I'm really interested to see how some of these kind of band-aids may evolve into very eloquent, um, more considered designs in the future. Um, and then I'm kind of interested in, the idea of office teaming. So there's always this weird discussion with clients about like, we want our office to be better. Um, and there's a few clients that already have to think about, but I think there's gonna be a lot more that um, really have to start with the, the conversation of um, how do we pull people in? Because now they have a choice to come or not. And so it's going to feel more like, um, you know, I think about um, retail or uh, amusement parks. How do you how do you pull people into that experience and get them really excited? Um, versus just saying like we have to come. So what would you like it to be? Um, and I think uh, you know, just in terms of um, why we come in, I think you'll see a lot more um, spaces that are that really help that. Um, those moments of collaboration or decision making or ideation so it's like we'll look to and lean into models that we know and hopefully we'll see new things but things like innovation hubs 
um, freighter spaces, event spaces, um, you know, sales offices, really the whole point is to kind of uh, uh, get to know people and leave at the end of the day feeling like you've been, you know, seal the deal. I think that like we'll see a lot more of that um, and, uh, and flexible providers will, will lean into that. Um, and yeah, I just, I just generally hope that the, that the user has more advocacy in the experience coming out of this. Makes a lot of sense. We actually um, have one very interesting audience question. Ken, do you have it in front of you? Maybe you can give it a, a whirl. We'll let the, our, our listeners in a little bit. You're mute. You're on mute. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, technology. <laughs> Okay, and while um, while we're here, I'd like to sort of remind the audience that um, our Q and A is open. So if you want to hear from um, uh, Liz Nelly, to, uh, you know, if you want to hear some, if you have a question to ask, uh, please please do ask. So the first question is um, from uh, Carlos uh, uh, Reimers. I hope I've got that right, but it's a very very specific um, uh, MIT question, which I think is fantastic. A lot of what we experience in life, and particular particularly in education is not intended because we don't always know what we're looking for. We're, we're, we're actually exposed to much more than what we, what we are interested in and can actually process. At MIT, that, that, pic, that idea was pictured in the, in the saying that learning at MIT is like trying to drink from, from a fire hose. But the, post, the COVID-19 world misses that. There are very few things that we are not intentionally doing because of the limitations of communication te techno technologies. Do you have any ideas of how, how, of how to create opportunities that will recreate that broad exposure to unintended experiences that, that can be so important to learning in life? For example, meeting at a plot. <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, a couple of quick examples. I think one is um, since uh, COVID hit, I've been doing this amazing thing called walking. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's pretty great. I got a suggestion from a friend who actually he lives in New York City. Um, John Braley is his name. And he, he does a walk around the block for his commute to like create a, a, you know, a separation between you know, home and work, even though they're in the same place. And you know, imagine what you experience on that walk. I also take a lot of meetings. Uh, just if, you know, if they're one-on-one -on -one and we don't need to look at content, I just walk. And, uh, you know, instead of staring at a screen, I'm like experiencing the world. And, uh, and in a way, maybe, you know, maybe more focused because there is an email or whatever or Slack in the other window. And then I think, you know, there are ways for technology to, um, you know, to create some serendipity. You know, there's things like um, window swap, uh, where you can swap your, your window view with somebody else's. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, basically look out their, their window or, you know, one thing I've been doing with our team is I just, I do weekly office hours where I just have an open Zoom invite and people can drop in, uh, you know, if they have questions to, you know, to make sure we get some of that serendipity. So I think there's, there's analog and digital uh, versions, um, but in a way, you know, it's still different because it's like planned serendipity, I guess, if that's a thing, like jumbo shrimp or something, I don't know. Um, yeah. No, I think that's the next one. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so Marilise, do you want to take the next question? If I can unmute myself. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes, we have another question here from Priscilla Capolonis. Um, and she asks, what work from home trends and what work from home behaviors do you envision as temporal and which ones do you think are more permanent, longer life? Hi, Priscilla. Um, <laughs> a friend. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, we did a great um, presentation together about a year ago, um, talking about the the, um, the science of space. So uh, all of the kind of trends that we talk about in space. There's a lot of um, you know research and um, evidence around some of the, you know a lot of those ideas and. Um, she's doing a, real, a lot of really great work at Google um, on the topic. So, um, gosh, I mean, this is like, this is, I'm going to answer this from like what I hope um, to see. 
I think uh, actually companies like Google are, I, I hope again, there's an employee advocacy to say, I wanna do a lot of my work at home. Um, and because of that, um, you know, I, I want the company to support me. And, and so a, an allowance for um, an at home setup. So actually, you know, the porosity of, of the, the, the organization and the employee isn't just about like we pay for when you come to us, it's more about we're, we're paying for you to have a good experience. So that extends into the, that arm extends into the home. So um, making sure that they have a kit of parts in their, in their home life, um, in their homework that is good for them. Um, what I hope to see from a home experience is I'm, I'm, uh, really jazzed by how open people are to like coming over to your house to have social distancing coffee. It like breaks down all these barriers. You know, I'm doing that uh, next week with someone I know from another company. They're driving over to my house. We're going to sit in the backyard and have coffee. And I just think that would never happen before. But it's really, it, it just sets a totally different tone. And I think that informality um, and new ways of knowing each other could be really, um, really exciting. Um, and I think, uh, you know, so I think temporary things might be more like, um, I, I hope people can calibrate the Zoom time and the, the feeling that they're always on. Um, and companies can start to build more practices around um, adjusting behavior and expectation. Um, yeah, and I just think more permanent, like we have, we have new ways of knowing each other and, and meeting and, um, you know, and, and, um, and also just like husbands and wives working, <laughs> knowing what each other does day to day is like super interesting. I get made fun of a lot more than I used <laughs> Well, you're the boss and yeah. I'm the wife, so yeah. I could tell you what yeah. there's someone in the room could actually tell you what they really think. <laughs> so, okay. Um, I think we are very, very close to the end. Pam's um, joining us on the screen means that we're really right at the end of our time. I wanted to say thank you to both of you for an exceptional and really thought-provoking hour um, and turn it over to Pam to close us out for the evening. Thank you, Liz and Elliot. Thank you, Marilise and Ken. This has really been informative. You've provided us with a grounded assessment of our predicament and its impact, and armed us with new vocabulary, tangible concepts, and an insightful analysis. I think the audience will agree, this will enable us to formulate our own approach to dealing with the upcoming changes. Yes, we will adapt. And I really like that part that Elliot mentioned about segmentation. I think something to think about. But I think we are out of time and I wanted to thank you again. Thank you everyone. Stay safe and well. Thank you, Pamela. And socially distance around of applause. Yeah. Sorry we didn't get to the last question. It's a it's a good one, but um, maybe we can think about that for our next. Our oh, next absolutely. Week. We'll send it to you if you'd like from Constance. Sure. Sure. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Marilyn. Yeah. I thank you very, very much. Thanks, thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.